We're in Ephesians chapter three today. Um, we're, gonna, we're continuing our series on Ephesians. In chapter one, we've, we've seen the wealth of the gospel. We were pre-adopted, uh, we, we, God in his predetermined plan adopted us as sons. He brought us into his family. In chapter two, we were dead in our sin, but God made us alive in Christ Jesus. So this amazing thing is going on. We're seeing the wealth of the gospel. We saw last week how God is displaying the manifold wisdom of his church. He's showing the the principalities, the rulers, the authorities of the heavenly places, and he's showing God's people coming together. So this is where we're at in Ephesians. We're continuing chapter three. And I want you to imagine with me for a moment living in a city that is marked by preeminence. Imagine living in a city where it was all about getting up the social ladder, climbing the social ladder. Imagine it being very competitive, very, I'm gonna one-up you, I'm gonna do whatever I can to be on top. Imagine being in a city based off performance, seeking status, seeking uh, achievement, and doing whatever it takes to get there. Imagine being in a city that is after prosperity, after, after, after being successful. And imagine being in a city that is filled with endless pleasure. You can get whatever you want You can get it on the weekend. Whatever the world has to offer, it has to offer you. You just have to go and take a hold of it. This is Ephesus. I wanna show you guys some pictures. Ephesus is not far from home. So if we could see, so this is a picture of Ephesus during the time of Paul's, when Paul visited it. Ephesus was a port city And you can see it was gigantic. It was over 200,000 people. That's enormous for that day and age. So because it was a port city, it was was very wealthy. Um, The people there were very successful. Anyone that moved to Ephesus was trying to build their career. They were trying to become successful in life. They were trying to build a business, whatever. I wanna show you the next picture. And this is a picture from the amphitheater. That amphitheater holds over 20,000 people. So imagine being able to go to, uh, go hear rhetoric, speeches, go, go see dramas, go see these amazing events take place. So this was not just a place of business, not just a place of climbing up the social ladder. This was a place of great entertainment. And I don't have it in this picture. I think it was in the other picture, but there was the Hippodrome, there was the Opera Hall. It was a Roman colony. In other words, it, had the, the, it was a, a society that was trying to be filled with performance and success and, 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 be, and, and, and have endless amounts of pleasure. This was, this was what the people in Ephesus were growing up in. And I wanna show you one more picture. This is the Temple of Artemis during Paul's time. It's pretty magnificent, as you can see. This Artemis, the the goddess of love, the goddess of sex, it says in some historians, ancient historians, that there would be a thousand prostitutes at a time standing outside of this temple, the temple of the goddess of love. So there was endless amounts of opportunity for pleasure, worldly pleasure. This was one of the seven wonders of the world. So people from all around the world, this was in between Asia and the Mediterranean. So people from all around the world came here to not just find a career, but to find what they hoped would be their satisfaction, their pleasure. This is where they were coming. This is Ephesus. And I want you to see something here today, that this is not far from home, is it? We live in Jacksonville, Florida. We live in a port city. We have almost endless opportunities to climb up the social ladder of success. We live in a society that is seeking preeminence, that's trying to one up the other, that's trying to beat each other out, competition. We live in a society that often compares us to other people around us. We live in a society that that is offering pleasure beyond what we could ever imagine. We live here in Ephesus right now. Jacksonville is a modern day Ephesus. So it relates greatly to you and I. As I read today, I want you to, I want want to ask you this question. 
is who are you in this story? As Paul gets ready to pray for the Ephesus believers, are you Paul the one praying for, for the Ephesian believers? Are you the Gentiles, the new believers in Jesus who are now living in Jesus? Or are you a Gentile that doesn't know Jesus yet? Maybe you're a couple of people, maybe you're Paul and the new believers at the same time. But think about who am I in this story today? Let's look at Ephesians. If you can turn in your Bibles to chapter three, we're gonna look at this starting with verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I wanna start right here where Paul says, for this reason. What reason? Why is Paul getting on his knees and praying for the Ephesus believers to have strength? What is the reason? We saw in chapter one that God adopted us as sons, This was his predetermined plan. In chapter two, we were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive in Christ. And then as we come to the end of chapter two, we see that God has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Jews and Gentiles are now becoming one in Christ Jesus. They're coming into the family of God. Praise God that you and I, we are the Gentiles, right? Unless you're Jewish today, we are Gentiles. It's just another word for nation in Greek. So the nations are coming to God. So this is what's happening. The nations are coming to Jesus. No longer are the Jews the only people of God. They're all coming to Jesus. And then we come to the end, the very end of chapter two, right before Paul prays. And I wanna read this passage. Verse 18 says this. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, for this reason I bow. And Paul continues his prayer. So what's the reason? He's seen, Paul, is, he's seen the wealth of the gospel. He's seen these people come to Jesus. And now he has this amazing vision. He starts to see these stones being shaped, these, these stones being formed, and it starts to build walls. And it builds a wall over here and a wall over here. And what happens is, is Paul, in this vision, has, he sees the church of Jesus, this amazing church, these living stones being built, you and I. That's exactly what's going on right here. And for this reason, Paul bows. Because Paul knew that in order for this to happen, something miraculous was going to have to take place. I want to show you guys an illustration, pulling out of my pocket an apple core. So I was eating this apple core, trying to build it for this illustration, and I accidentally ate too much. I got a little bit excited. So that is, I know you guys can't probably see that. There's two, two pieces of an apple core. Kind of wrecked my illustration. I was telling Chris Keeler before the service, I was like, I was like, oh, no. And he's like, what happened? What happened? I said, I just ate too much of the apple. <laughs> so this, this is what we come to Jesus like. This is you and I. We come to Jesus like this. Before we, we have Jesus save us, we're like an apple core. We've been eaten up by sin. 
We've been eat, eaten up by life's worries, by life's issues, all the battles that we face. And we come to God and we're like, man, I'm dead. I have no value. I'm empty. I'm purposeless. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gone. This is us before Jesus. But when Jesus makes us a new creation, there's an apple seed in here. Jesus goes, I'm making you, you guys cannot see this, so this illustration is probably not good. I promise you I'm holding something. It doesn't matter if I am or not, right? I'm holding something right now. You just have to have faith and believe. Who has faith this morning? Who's a follower of Jesus today? Come on. Believe in the apple seed. Come on. So we have this seed and God says, I'm making you a new creation. And we come to God and we go, God's made me a new creation, but how in the world is God going to use that? How in the world, I, I have too bad of a history. I have too much failure. I have too much damage. This is how we come to Jesus. There is a lot of work that needs to happen in order for us to become the manifold wisdom of God like, God is, like Paul talked about last week, the manifold wisdom of God that displays how amazing Jesus is and shocks the enemy by the way we live our lives. It takes a lot of work. So Paul's going, it's gonna take a miracle. It's going to take a miracle. We are this seed. And I actually was on my way out to the car and I picked up an acorn because that's a better illustration. And you can probably see that better. I was like, oh, I should have probably used an acorn. Because it does say that God is going to make us mighty oaks of righteousness. And an oak tree is a little bit cooler than an apple tree. Amen. So I want to ask you a question today. Is God able? Yes. Is he able to take this new creation and make something magnificent out of it? Therefore, Paul gets on his knees in prayer and makes four key prayer requests. And as we walk through this, it's just it's amazing. As he, as he walks through these prayer requests, you're gonna see each request is connected to a purpose. Let's look at this, the first request. He says, for this reason, verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. I want you to notice the first thing Paul does when he prays is he bows. He gets on his knees. In all the ancient world, it was, it, you look at through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, not all the time, but very often we see people getting on their knees and praying. They're bowing before the Father, praying on their knees. And it's easy just to walk through this and go, man, whatever, he's bowing on his knees. But I think this is, this is important. That, that our posture, this is a posture of, it's a posture of surrender and submission and humility. And Paul is coming before the Lord and he's basically going, I can't do this, only you can, Lord. I was talking to my daughters last night. I think posture is very important. We were reading the Bible together. They were tired. We had just watched Lion King, the new Lion King. I, have, I, I didn't get to watch all of it, I watched half of it. I was like, man, this is an awesome movie. Um, but we were just, we, we were, they were tired, we had a long day today. The day we played together all day. And uh, they were starting to fall asleep when I was reading the Bible, and I don't like that. Yeah. They were like, and, and Olivia's like, I said, wake up. And Olivia's like, but daddy, I'm so tired. And she was like kind of slouched on the couch, just like, and their eyes were like, I was like, man, what are you gonna be like as a teenager? <laughs> and her eyes were just like drooping, and I said, wake up. And she was so tired. I said, you were wide awake five minutes ago watching The Lion King. You can wake up for Jesus. And I said, Darcy and Olivia, wake up. They sat, they sat straight up. And I said, put a smile on your face right now. <laughs> Be excited about Jesus and reading his word. They're all, <laughs> they're smiling real, real big. And I said, I said, I said, and they're all like, they're like starting to giggle. I said, you notice you feel different. It's because your posture is different. And I think when we come to Jesus in our devotion, when we come to in our prayer life, our posture is important. If we, if we act defiant, we're gonna feel defiant. 
If we act lazy by just drooping on, the, on our pillows, and I used to do that all the time, three weeks ago. <laughs> but, but after reading this, I've transformed, man, amen? <laughs> but our posture is important. If we get up, we get in a, in a state of focus, in a state of, 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 of I'm gonna be this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my full undivided attention, God begins to move. He begins to change our attitude. I want you to also notice that Paul says, I'm praying, I bow before the father of all families. The father of all families that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened. Everyone just look around right now, around the room. Look at all the people. Awkward, right? (laughs) Don't look at me, I don't know who you are. But there's a lot of people in this room this morning. God made every single one of you. When we come and we pray, we're praying to the father of every family. Ever go to the Atlanta airport? There's too many people. God made all those people. So even the ones you despise as they're in your way, God loves them, he made them. You know, it, it, I, I, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but our creator is right now creating the universe. It is expanding faster than the speed of light. Our creator is not done creating. He's continuing to create. His new creation is, is still forming and he's gonna just keep on creating. That's who we're praying to. He's rich according to the riches of his glory, his awesome power, his awesome presence. According to the riches of his glory, we are calling on his name and we're asking him to strengthen. Amen? Amen. Who's he praying to? He's praying, Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen their inner man. He's not praying for their circumstances to change. Jacksonville's circumstances may not change. Your your circumstances may not change, but your inner man can change. And if your inner man changes, it doesn't matter what happens to your outward circumstances. And this power, Paul says, comes through his Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says that, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Praise God. The second request is this. And before I get into this, I just wanna ask you a question. How would your prayer life change if you mirror, if we, how would our prayer lives change if we mirrored Paul's prayer life? Just think about that. What does Paul pray, why does Paul pray for them to have strength? Let's look at the second request. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This word dwell is more than just to receive Jesus. It means to inhabit in the Greek. It means to abide. So when Paul says, I pray that you'd be strengthened so that Christ may dwell in you, he's saying, I pray that Christ would become active in your life. That just as John says in John 15, he says, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the what? The branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. Jesus wants to abide in us. He wants to be actively involved in our lives. It's not just receiving Jesus on Sunday or receiving Jesus once and coming to get your fill on Sunday and go and live the rest of your life. He wants to be actively at work in your life. And I want you to see this as this happens, something miraculous happens to this seed, to you, as you're abiding in Christ, as he's as you're dwelling with him, as he's inhabiting you, something miraculous happens. He says that you may be rooted and grounded in God's love. So what happens is you take this little bitty seed and you're going, how's that gonna do anything? How is that gonna build anything? How's that gonna change anything? As Jesus dwells inside of you, 
the roots of your life begin to dig, dig deep into his love. And when this happens, you begin to become a transformed man, a transformed woman. Is Jesus actively involved in your life right now? Is he involved? Do you see his presence at work in your life in this moment? Are you rooted? Are you grounded in his love? Let's look at the third request. Why does Paul want the Ephesians to have Christ abiding in their life? That you being rooted and grounded in love, here's the third request, may, and this is interesting, this passage, you see what the requests are, every request has may before it. Lord, may you do this, may you do this. May have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth parentheses, of this love. So Paul is saying, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them, that they would be, their faith would be in you and that you dwell inside them. They'd begin to dig roots deep. And as this happens, they would be able to comprehend. Now this word comprehend in Greek is very important. It's not the comprehend that we know in our English language. It's so much better. It means to take hold of. It means to grasp Firmly, It means to overtake. Therefore, you can see why Paul is praying that they would be strengthened. This love isn't something they just receive by doing anything. This love only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into your life and giving you the strength to actually take hold of it. In other words, I'm taking hold of all of God's love. I'm grabbing hold of all of of who he is. I'm firmly holding on to his love. That's what Paul is after. And what did Paul want the Ephesians to take hold of? He says that they may take hold of the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love. Is this just saying like the limitless level of God's love? I think it's so much bigger. This is not throwaway language. We're not just saying like God's love with just every part of it. No, it's so much deeper than that. First of all, the breadth of God's love. When I did a word study, study on this word, the only other time it's used is in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 21, and it talks about the new Jerusalem. It says that God is going to come, heaven and earth are going to become one, and God is going to build a new Jerusalem. It's going to be hundreds of thousands of miles wide, hundreds of thousands of miles long. It's going to be absolutely enormous. In other words, God's presence, his love is going to cover the earth. So when it talks about it in Revelation, the breadth of God's love, it's literally covering the earth. It's God's all-encompassing love. Why is this so important? To the people of Ephesus, think about it. They were living in a preeminent, trying to one up the other, trying to compare yourself to each other, trying to fight up to the top of the social ladder. God's love is all encompassing. God's love loves the Jew just as much as the Gentile and the Gentile as much as the Jew. He loves the rich as much as he does the poor. He loves the athlete as much as he does the non-athlete. He loves the successful as much as the non-successful. Do you get what Paul is saying here? God's love is not based on your performance. God's love is not based on how well you can climb up the social ladder, at how rich you are, at how charismatic you are, at how successful you are. God loves you just as much as he loves him, and he loves him just as much as he loves you. Now, I want you to think about this. Is there, think about the person that has hurt you the most. Think about the person that you despise the most. Think about the person... Just take a moment. God loves them just as much as he loves you. Wow. Really? God loves you or them just as much as he loves you? So this is the breath of God's love. I was in Nashville, Tennessee this past week and I experienced the breath of God's love. We were, in a, we were in a classroom of pastors. We were at a preaching conference and, 
And it was very stressful. We had to get, everyone was so funny. We were, at first we were so stressed out because we're preaching in front of professionals. And they, they, what we were doing is they were critiquing you and showing you where you were, where you needed, where, where it could help improve your messages and stuff. And I got up as the first one to speak and, and it, I was a little bit nervous. And, and, but as I was going, I just, everyone was like, amen. That's good, that's so good. I felt so much love because there was, it was just overwhelming, the breath of God's love in that building, in that room. None, of, but by the time we got done it, we were so filled with joy, we were so filled with excitement. Every person in the room, I said, guys, this is amazing. We can't lose in this kind of environment. Imagine if we lived with the breath of God's love. There'd be no fear of failure, there'd be no jealousy, there'd be no comparison. We would just be relaxed in each other's presence. I mean, even when I get up here on stage, it would be, I would be fearless, even though I'm not fearless, right? Like, this is scary, being up here. <laughs> but imagine if we live with that kind of breath of God's love. The length of God's love. How far God's love goes to reach us. This is also in the new Jerusalem. God's love goes after the lost sheep. You cannot, in other words, outrun God's love. Yeah. We see this in the Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep. The shepherd goes after the lost sheep. The lost coin, the person goes after the lost coin. The prodigal son, the father doesn't give up. God's love always outruns our failures and our mistakes. God's love doesn't grow tired or weary. God's love just keeps on. You cannot outrun God's love. Can you imagine if we took hold of the length of God's love? What it would do to our lives. What it would do to our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family members. God's love doesn't give up. The height of God's love, this is the next part Paul wants him to take hold of. The height, the endless supply of God's love. This is also, you see this in the New Jerusalem as well. It's, the, it's God's love, it's just, it's, you think about this, it's, there's an endless supply of it. Our sin and our failures cannot outsupply, all of our mistakes can't outsupply God's love. God's love is patient. It bears with one another. It, 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 it keeps on giving and giving and giving. Imagine if we took hold of the height of God's love, what would our relationship with our boss be like? I forgive you the 500,000th time. Imagine what our relationship with our wives would be like. I forgive you. Our siblings, our coworkers, our classmates. God's love is endless in its supply. And then the, finally, the depth of God's love. God's love reaches down into our darkest moments. And in scripture, this is used in, in it, when it talks about the very depths of the sea, the very deepest, darkest areas of your life. The depths of Sheol in your most tragic situations. I was talking to Patrick Nealis, whose mother passed away this week, and we were on the phone yesterday, and... I just sat there in, in, in just awe going, Lord, how? How, I can't even fathom losing my mother. God's love wants to meet you in the darkest moments, in the lowest moments of your life. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've been betrayed by someone. Maybe you've gone through divorce. Maybe you've been abandoned. Maybe you've been rejected. God's love wants to meet you in the deepest, darkest moments of your life. So I wanna ask you a question. What is your source today? What is your source? Is it rooted in God's love or is it in Ephesus? Is it in social status? Is it in pleasure and entertainment. What is your source? Where are you going to to get filled up this morning? And the last request is this. He says, Paul says, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I want you to notice this progression. So Paul's gone on his knees. He's prayed for strength that they may have Jesus dwelling inside of them, that their roots would dig deep down in love and, and take hold of the depth, height, width, length of God's love in order that they might be filled with the fullness of God. God wants to fill you up with his fullness this morning. There is more in store for you. So I want to ask you this question again. Is God able? Is God able? Is he able to do all this? Is he really able to strengthen me with his Holy Spirit and, 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 and give me the strength to take hold of Jesus and actually have Jesus actively at work in my life? Is that even possible? Is he able to root me into his love so deeply, so grounded that I come back every time, every time, every time to it, no matter what circumstances I'm in? Is he able to do this? Is he able to fill me up with the fullness of who he is? Is he able to sanctify me and make me just like his son, Jesus, where I'm living victorious on this earth? Is he able? That's the question for today. Let's see what Paul says. Verse 20, now to him, let's look at this. Now to him who is able. Praise God. Praise God, come on. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Is God able? He's able. Paul uses, he writes this doxology. This is a word of, of, of a declaration, a doxology in the Greek is a declaration of praise, glorifying God. Paul writes this and he says, is he able? And he says, yes. And I want you just to know Paul for just a second. Paul was a Pharisee that came to Jesus. He was the top of society. He was on the top of the social ladder. He was on top of the business ladder. He was outperforming anyone else. He became a Christian and he became the lowest in society. Where was Paul gonna now find his affirmation? Where was he gonna find his significance? He was now the lowest in the world's eyes. Paul was not just a Christian that was the lowest in the world's eyes. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter one that Paul plants a church in Corinth and the very church that he planted, people in the church, pastors come in and they start to compare him to other pastors. I follow Paul, Apollos. I follow Peter. I follow Paul. So now there's this competition. It's, it's also a Roman colony, a very competitive, a very, I'm going to work my preeminent, working my way up the social ladder. Paul is very, seeing his very people actually starting to go, man, we'd rather have Apollos be our pastor. We'd rather have Peter be our pastor. Can you imagine what Paul felt? We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that Paul's he, when he leaves Corinth and he goes to plant more churches, that a group of leaders rise up in the church and they start to undermine Paul's leadership. Basically saying that Paul's not the man, you shouldn't follow him. And his own people start to turn their back on him. Can you imagine what Paul was going through? He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was imprisoned. Where did Paul find the strength he found it because the Holy Spirit strengthened him and Jesus was actively at work in his life and his roots dug down deep, so deep, so grounded into God's love that nothing, he was like a mighty oak that could not be shaken. Every time Paul comes back to Jesus, Lord, I've fulfilled your assignment. Jesus looked at him and said, there's more there's more. Lord, I built a church in Corinth. There's more. Yeah. I built a church in Ephesus. There's more, Paul. I'm in, I'm in chains. I'm in Corinth and I'm waiting my imprisonment. Paul, there's more. As Paul, it says in, 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 in the book of Romans, 
as Paul writes to the Romans from Corinth. He wasn't in prison in Corinth and this spoke that. Or yes, he was for a little bit. Or um, Caesarea, I'm sorry, doesn't matter. But as Paul looked out on the horizon, he saw the Roman people in his mind and God said, I have more. He looked to the ends of the earth. There is more for you today. God is able. God is able to use you to impact your neighborhood. He is able to, to, to break the addiction off of your life. He is able to heal your marriage. He is able to save you this morning. He is able to do the impossible. God is able to do abundantly more than all we ask or even imagine. If everyone could bow your heads. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. Lord God, some of us came into this room today and we were like an eaten up apple core. Life is just eating at us. And we're going, Lord, I'm lost. I feel dead. I need you to make me a new creation. If that's you today, no one's looking around. I just want you to raise your hand right now. If you want Jesus to come into your life today and save you and make you a new creation. Just boldly raise your hand. No one is looking around. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else this morning? This is your step of faith. You're going, I'm holding on to Jesus. You know, it's like this. I want to share this analogy. Imagine being in an ocean, all alone, you get dropped off, there's no boat around, no life raft, and you're just trying to survive. You're just swimming there. What's eventually gonna happen? You're gonna drown. You're gonna get tired, you're gonna get worn out, you're gonna start to cramp up, and you're going to drown. That's what it's like before we meet Jesus. We do everything we can in our own strength. We try with every ounce of energy, with every resource we have, I'm just gonna try everything I can to hold up, to stay afloat. But I'm here today to tell you that you don't have to drown. Because out of nowhere, it says in Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine, that by God's grace, through faith, we are saved. In other words, you're in the ocean, you're drowning, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a hand extends down to you. From the sky, that hand is the hand of Jesus Christ today going, I'm here to save you. But that's not the end. That's God's grace. You have to put your faith in that hand and you have to grab a hold of it. It's not by works, but it is by trusting in Him. So I'm gonna ask you one last time, is there anyone else today you're saying, I'm ready to let go of trying to do this in my own strength and grab a hold of that hand today. I want you to boldly raise your hand right now. Thank you. I see your hands. Praise God. Praise God. Heavenly Father, you can lower your hands. Heavenly Father, bless these people. Holy Spirit, make your home in them now, right now. Just ask Jesus to come into your heart. Lord Jesus, save me right now. Save me right now. May I know you. I want you to, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to save me, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that you're reaching these people right now and that you're gonna make them a new creation and there's work to be done, but it's gonna be by your strength through your Holy Spirit that's gonna transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to 
give one call to action this week. Everyone pull out your phones real quick. This is what I want to, I want to challenge you to do. I want you to walk through Paul's prayer daily. You don't have to do this. I'm just encouraging you to do this. So what I want you to do is, and if you're not going to do this, that's fine. You can text someone right now if you want. But I want you to take your phone and I want you to put in your calendar right now a time when you can pray Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 each day in prayer. It may be in the morning, it may be at lunchtime, it may be before you go to bed at night. But this is what I want, I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to get in a posture of focus, a posture of humility. Now, a lot of us cannot get on our knees. I understand that. But getting in a chair and actually leaning forward and getting focused is better than laying on the bed. Find a place where you can be undis undistracted. Don't do this just in the car. You can pray through the car throughout the week, but find at least one time in the day where you can get in, a, in an attitude of focus, in an attitude of submission and surrender and actually start praying through this prayer. Because I promise you, if you take this leap of faith, if you take this, not even leap, this step of faith, that God's gonna begin to strengthen not only you, but the people around you. Amen. He's gonna work something miraculous. So I want you to do this. I want, you, I, want, I want to encourage you to start off with your family. Pray for your wife. Pray for your husband. Pray for your children. Pray for your mom and dad. Pray for your siblings. Start there and start growing outwards. Then start praying for your life groups. Praying for the men in your group. Just going through this prayer daily. Watch what happens as you do this. Amen.